You're watching the CBBC channel. Don't go anywhere because it's time to make a lot of noise in Raw. <laughs> Welcome to Raw. I'm Alex. And I'm Matt. And we are at the outdoor enclosure of the Palace of the Apes at the Howlers and Portland Wild Animal Parks in Kent. And this spectacular fella is Jala. He's the male gorilla of the group. And he's a very proud chap at the moment because not one, but three of his females are pregnant. This is fantastic news for the parks because a female gorilla can't give birth until she's reached the age of about 10. Once pregnant, she won't have another baby for about three years. So it's a very exciting time at the park and we will of course keep you posted on the progress of the group and with any luck, those three new arrivals throughout the course of the series. But first, here's what's coming up on today's programme. We try and get the perfect imprint of a lion's paw. Go on, Alex, hold him still. No, thanks. I've got my hands full already, helping the keepers feed this snow leopard. And it's a worrying time for Simon, the primate keeper, as one of his precious monkeys gets a terrible bite wound on his hand. No matter how cute and cuddly the animals at the park look, they are all essentially wild animals. This lovely bush dog, for example, looks friendly, but has been known to corner keepers he doesn't like and won't let them out of his enclosure. <laughs> then tigers are so powerful and dangerous that keepers have to feed them through a special hatch in the fence. But there are a few exceptions to this rule. Melindy is a serval cat, and you would never get near her in the wild. But because she was hand-raised, she will allow keepers that she likes to play with her. One of her favourite keepers is Ben Warren, and we've brought her a snake to play with today, which will help to keep her mind and body active. Don't worry, it's a plastic one. <laughs> she, oh, I don't know if you want to play tug of war with a snake, Melindy. <laughs> um, obviously, Melindy was hand raised, so how does that affect her behaviour, Ben? Uh, she's very tame, <laughs> obviously, when going in with her like this. Uh, she's just absolutely sort of wonderful to play with. Sort of. She's not going to let go of the snake, Ben. Do, do <laughs> several cats hunt uh, snakes in the wild? Uh, if they come across one, I'm sure they would uh, have to deal with it. Uh, <laughs> Even yeah. a poisonous snake? Yeah. Uh, she'd have to be very quick. She'd do a lot of lunging, and when she found her moment, she'd go for the sort of just behind the head so the, the snake can't turn around and bite her. Ah. So, um, a bit like it is now, really. Yeah. She's, she's really gripping it very tightly, and... Yeah. He doesn't have any intention of letting go. <laughs> if you let it go, she'll run off and we'll get it back. Oh, look. So, obviously, her sort of um, <laughs> killer instinct must kick in <laughs> when she's given a toy like this, Ben, is that right? Yeah. If I run, will she follow me? If you're quicker than her, yeah. <laughs> she <might be> quick. <laughs> she's got it already. <laughs> <laughs> she's very fast. How fast can a serval cat run? Uh, <laughs> I would have thought in the region about 35, 40 miles an hour. As fast as that? She is quick, isn't human. she? Yeah. And what other sort of toys does she play with? <laughs> She's enjoying uh, this. We've got balls in here for her, <laughs> and uh, she likes sort of cloth things, like old towels and stuff. <laughs> and what, what's her personality like? Uh, she's very good tempered, you know. Obviously, we're in here now with her, and uh, she doesn't mean any harm. She doesn't want to bite you or scratch you or anything. So. Well, yeah, very <laughs> Ben, this has been great fun, and she's certainly not going to let go of this <laughs> snake. <laughs> Thank you very much. No worries. <laughs> Come on, Ben. It's right. Keeper Carl Parker has worked with Malayan tapirs for five years. Malayan tapirs come from swampy areas in Southeast Asia and, as you can see, are pretty amazing-looking animals. Now, keepers shouldn't really have favourites, but this four-year-old female called Malacca takes a lot of beating. I've known her all her life, ever since she was a, a bump in her mummy's belly. So, um, 
Yeah, my relationship with her is very close. Um, we've been through quite a bit, the pair of us, um, in the sense that she was quite ill when she was a baby. So um, I spent a lot of time with her. So she trusts me quite a lot. So it um, just makes life a lot easier when she's with trust. So, um, and occasional banana sandwich. So, and they like the skin as well. We don't. Have you ever eaten banana skin? No, it's very bitter. It tastes awful, but they seem to like it. So, and if it's wrapped up in a bit of bread, it tastes even better, I think, doesn't it? And now, can you not like that face? Okay. Mmm, nice. Nice. Yeah, she's she's just fun to be around, really. What the bellies? Oh, belly. Hey, where's your belly? Where's your belly? Show me your belly. Sadly, Carl is going to have to say goodbye to Malacca in the next few weeks. Malayan tapirs are extremely endangered. There are only 3,000 left in the wild, so it's vital that Malacca has the chance to have babies. The park's breeding program has been really successful. Little Tenji was born a few months ago and is Malacca's niece. Sadly, there's no suitable male here for Malacca to breed with, which is why she has to go to a new home. But she's not going far. She's moving on now, so over to, over to our sister park at Howlett's, um, which is going to be a sad day for me. She's going over there. She's going to go with a male that was here, which is Kingut. So he breeds with, with her and she has a baby. Then um, that's, that's all, all good. Carl is anxious to make sure Malacca will be happy in her new home. So this morning he's come over to the other park to meet the man who looks after the tapirs there, Joel Bunce. It's certainly a lot louder at this park as Malacca's new neighbours will be a group of rather noisy Simon gibbons. But will her enclosure meet Carl's high standards? Thanks. Um, we really could do with a, another rail on the bottom of that. Yep, Joel. Just come down here with it a bit, down to about that height. She, she'll push her body through there. Yeah. Because if the egg goes, she, she assumes that everything else follows. Get a swimming pool built for him, because um, Malacca loves water. Nothing but the best for Carl's beloved tapirs. This one is called Kingut, and Joel looks after him these days, but he spent his first two years with Carl. He will be Malacca's new mate. Your new wife coming over soon? Yes. Thank you, boy. Carl's very pleased to see Kingut again. Um, he's very attached to his Malayan tapirs, I know that. And Kingut loves a fuss most of the time. So, yeah, it looks um, it's like a nice reunion there. Letting go of Malacca is going to be hard for Carl, but for Joel it's a very exciting time, as Kingut is currently the only Malayan tapir at Howlett's. He's been on his own a little while now, so he could do with the company. And if he gets to breed, it would be brilliant, because he's never actually bred before, so hopefully they'll settle down and make a nice breeding pair and hopefully produce lots of little baby Malayan tapirs. That's the ultimate goal. Malacca is not leaving today, but it won't be long before the big move. We'll join Carl later on to see how the preparations are going. <laughs> Earlier in the series, I helped the keepers take an imprint of a tiger's paw. The park take these Plaster of Paris casts into schools to show children just how big their feet can get. And it's a lot easier than taking a real tiger into class. Well, today it's the lion's turn, and keepers Adrian Harland and Pete Thompson have come to help us measure Jabir's massive paws. Well, you may be wondering, with a cat the size of Jabir here, how I'm going to survive searching for that pit. <laughs> well... Lucky for me, Adrian and I are going to search his big enclosure here for a print that's suitable. Adrian, ooh, he likes you. <laughs> Why don't you and I go and have a search for one? You two can, well, have a chat with Jabir. <laughs> OK. Pete, Jabir's paws are huge. I bet his claws are pretty massive as well. Yeah, they're about four to five centimetres uh, long, uh, and they retract them, so if they're playing or um, they're just generally walking around, they don't use them. Um, they're actually inside. Um, you see, you've got one here. This, wow, yeah, look this at is that. this is part of one. 
That is, see. well, that's pretty huge, isn't it? Yeah. Look at that. And there'd be some more around the top here and a, a bit more on the length as well. When the claws come out, they'll grab hold of the prey, bring it down, uh, and they can just tear it apart with them quite easily. Easily indeed. Jabir is a Barbary lion, and these are the largest of all the lion species. But sadly, due to hunting, they are now extinct in the wild. Barbary lions lived in the Atlas Mountains in North Africa, where they would feed on animals like gazelle and zebra. This is the only species of lion the park looks after, and is one of just a few places in the world where you can see them today. Well, we found the most fantastic lion paw print here in the sound, and I'm mixing up my plaster of Paris, ready to pour in. Adrian, what do you think of that one? Yeah, it's a cracker, isn't it? It, it is a good one, isn't it? This sand is actually very handy. They show up well, don't they? Why have we got this in here? Uh, well, education, again, one of, one of the things we're trying to show here is the environment that they come from, the habitat that they live in. And uh, these came from the Atlas Mountains in north of Africa. Yeah. On one side of the Atlas Mountains, it's a kind of Mediterranean climate with um, some holly bushes and uh, juniper and things like that. But on the other side, it sweeps down into the Sahara. So this is the Sahara Desert. Fantastic. All their environments reflected in one enclosure. Very good. So you've got a very important collection here for the species. We have. There's maybe 60 or 70 of them left in the world, yeah. and uh, we're trying to keep the line going in the hope that maybe one day we can return them. Oh, that would be fantastic, wouldn't it? Well, what do you think of my mix? That looks sloppy enough, do you think? <laughs> I think should go. Mm, let's give it a go. It might look a tiny bit thick. OK, here we go. No, I think it is a tiny bit thick. I'm going to put a bit more water. Yes, um, yeah, I want to have you making custard at my house. <laughs> And I noticed, actually, that you can't see the claws at all. I guess that's because they, they retract them, don't they? Yes. I, they would be out if it was hunting or stalking, something like that, ready to run and pounce. Yes. But here they're just paddling around, um, minding their own business. So um, we would be unlikely to see claw prints in any of the tracks here. Right. Here we go, then. I'll spoon the rest of this in. And hopefully, later, we'll have a perfect How are you paw print. On? Well, we're doing rather well. Oh, we found this well, gorgeous yeah, print, yeah, which you can't well. see now, because, of course, I've covered it in plaster of Paris. And did Matt mix it up correctly, Adrian? Well, I'm no expert myself. <laughs> Adrian said he wouldn't eat my custard, <laughs> but uh, I think my meringues maybe will be it better. It does look like meringue. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is obviously going to take a little while to set, so while I finish it off, why don't you pop off, but come back later because we'll be revealing our perfect lion paw print. <laughs> What do you call a sick crocodile? An alligator. <laughs> what do you call an exploding monkey? A boom. <laughs> what do you get if you cross a zebra with a pig? Stripey sausages. <laughs> Hello. Back at the Tapir House, Keeper Carl is spending his last few days with Malacca, the four-year-old female he's cared for since birth. She's going to be moved down the road to Port Lim's sister park, where she will have a chance to breed. I will miss you, won't I? Hey? Yes. Ooh. Won't I? Carl's built up a real bond with Malacca over the years. She's a big girl, weighing nearly half a ton. That's the same as two male gorillas. But underneath, Carl knows she's a softy. It's like being um, cuddled by your mum or dad, really, and they do like a scratch. Um, helps. They've got very sensitive skin, actually, for, for such a large animal, because there's, there's, about, there's about an inch of fat, hard fat, about that deep on these. And what that's for is, because they're aquatic, they spend, look, in the wild, they probably spend 70% of their time in water. And what they do is that when they're in the water, they, they extend that nose out of the water, won't you? And they use it as a snorkel, like when you go snorkeling when you're on holiday. You've got your goggles on and your snorkel, but they use it and then they walk along the bottom. The keeper's job is to make their animals' lives as happy as possible, which means also keeping their minds occupied. Give some feed for Malacca, just something for her to play with, really, and she'll roll it about, and then um, and she rolls it about, it goes like that, and the, and the nuts fall out the bottom. 
Um, good for good for their mind. Uh, stimulates them to to think. She's more of a more of a header than a, than um, a footer, so she 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 roll it about with her head rather than use her feet. Tapirs have a fantastic sense of smell. In fact, it's 50 times more powerful than ours, so Malaka can easily sniff out those treats. She's even using that long snout to pick them up and pop them in her mouth, just like an elephant uses its trunk. That's a clever girl. But like her football, Malaka's attention span is not up to much. Carl decides it's the perfect opportunity to take some photos. That way, once Malacca has gone, she certainly won't be forgotten. Oh, good girl. Smile. Good girl. Well done. I have built a, a that very special bond with her, so, um, yeah, when she does finally go, I'll be a bit upset, I think. Later in the series, it will be time for Malacca to leave, and we will be with Carl when he has to say his final goodbyes. We're outside the Black Capped Capuchin Monkey Enclosure to ask Keeper Simon Jeffrey lots of facts about these fantastically furry monkeys. In the wild, do they always stick together in groups? Yes, they do. They live in very big groups. They can live in groups of up to about 50 monkeys. 50? And how many have you got here? Uh, we've got 12 in here. Is that one big family? Yeah, this is one big family. And do they have any enemies in the wild? Yeah, in the wild, where they come from, they come from South America, so they have things like um, eagles that might attack them and jaguars. Really? What is jaguar? What's a jaguar? Jaguar is a type of leopard. It's a very big cat. How long do they live? Capuchin monkeys live a very long time. They're one of the longest lived monkeys in the world. They live till about 60 years old. Really? And what's the oldest monkey we've got here? The oldest one we've got in here is 45. Now, that is old for a monkey. Are they good at swinging through trees? Yeah, they're very good at travelling through trees. Um, they're very agile and they're very fast. They've got a prehensile tail which you can grip onto any branches so they can get through the trees incredibly well. Do they use their tails to hang from things? Yes, they do use their tails to hang from things. Their tails are incredibly strong. They can actually support their whole weight. Really, they can completely just hang? Yep. Swing around? Do they have sharp teeth? Uh, capuchins have very sharp teeth. They're well known for breaking into all sorts of nuts, like Brazil nuts and walnuts and all sorts. Yeah, I can see they're like little needles in there. Are they ever aggressive towards humans? Yes, they can be aggressive towards humans. I mean, this is usually quite a nice group, but I mean, if you happen to possibly get them in a corner or something went wrong, then yes, they can be aggressive towards you. Well, that was some great facts. Thank you very much, Simon. And what do you lot think? Shall we give these lovely capuchins some more seeds? Yeah! Here we go. down to the snow leopard enclosure with keeper Ricky Neal because it's feed time. Ricky, I can see the snow leopards inside. Are we going to go in and feed them? No, no, no. Uh, they're very, very dangerous animals to actually go in with, so I've specifically locked them away into the small shut-off area so we could go into the big side freely right. and put down the food. Wow, Ricky, this is a fantastic enclosure. Where do you want me to put the meat? Um, well, I generally put a piece of meat up on the tunnel here for the male, because it's one of his favourite places of sitting. OK. And I generally put the females down by the fence just down there. OK, I'll put this over here. So Fine. why do you put them separately, then? Um, just to keep the two snow leopards away from each other, really, because um, the female is quite aggressive towards the male, and if both bits of food are there, she's going to sit on them and the boy's not going to feed. So she's more dominant, then? She's very dominant, yeah, yes. Snow leopards are found in the Himalayan mountains, which is one of the coldest places in the world. 
and it's believed there are only about 5,000 of these beautiful creatures left. They have a much tougher time getting their dinner in the wild than at the park, as they often have to hunt their prey on vertical rock faces. This one looks very hungry, so I think it's about time for you to let her out, Alex. Are you ready? Yep, there oh, ready. here we go. So where is she? Oh, here she comes, here she comes. Growling a bit. What's all that growling about, Ricky? Um, it's, it's a warning, yeah, as such. No. She knows her feet's there. I cannot get over the size of a snow leopard's tail. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's used for two things, really. One for balance when they're on the mountain tops and running down. You know, they use it as a, a rudder, as such, to run after their prey. And secondly, they wrap up in it and keep themselves it keeps nice them warm. Yeah. Oh, his, this is the male. Now, he's oh, gone for the meat that we thought the female was going to go for. I think he's just spotted his piece. But yeah, that's, now, what does that... Is that, that happy sound? That's to say that's his meat now. Oh, he's warning our cameraman yeah, it, off, isn't he? It's just a warning to say, look, this is mine. OK. Oh, he's got it and he's off. Now, ah, he's going up. He wants to eat it quite wants... high up in the enclosure. Yeah. There he goes. But this enclosure, I mean, I notice there's lots of really high ledges up here. Does that really mimic what their environment would be like in the wild? Yeah, so they would live on high mountain ridges. And, I mean, they could jump from one of those shelves and be on the floor in one bound. Can they, they really? They so they're very so powerful, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. yeah. And you've obviously got a pair here, so are you hoping for some breeding? Oh, yes, yes. We're... This is a breeding pair. Um... A few months we, I did see them breeding actually, and uh, their gestation period is three months. So, you know, maybe within a month or so, we will be having little baby snow leopard cubs. Oh, well, that would be really exciting. I think they are the most magnificent cats I've seen. So, you will keep us posted, won't you, if no, there's any cubs arriving? Yes, yes. Thanks, Ricky. <laughs> Oh, isn't he cute? With his sweet little nose and that pretty stripe along his back, I bet you would like to take one home and have it as a pet. But wait, if he's so cute, why is he kept in here? Looks can be deceiving. This is in fact a ferocious killer that has to be kept behind a 10,000 volt electric fence. This is a honey badger. Ben Warren is a pretty fearless keeper and thinks nothing of going into enclosures with some of the most dangerous cats in the world. But nothing will get him into a cage with a honey badger. <laughs> There's not a chance I'd go in with them. Work with all different cats, snakes, dogs. And these are the only things that really I don't want to go in with. <laughs> They're not scared of anything at all. They would literally take on anything in the wild. Honey badgers live across central and southern Africa and southern Asia and will live in a wide variety of habitats from dense woodland to deserts. Although not listed on the international list of endangered animals, honey badgers are being killed and their numbers are believed to be in decline. Their main predator is man and they are regularly slaughtered by farmers for killing their livestock. Honey badgers are so vicious, they have no natural predators. And thanks to their design, they can literally start a fight with anything. They have these amazing jaws. When they grab onto something, no matter what, you cannot prise their jaws off. And with the set of teeth they have, you don't really stand too much chance. There's one account of one latching onto an elephant's trunk. I mean, the elephant would beat the badger to death, but because these badgers have locked jaw, Snatched into the elephant's trunk, got beaten to death, and then the elephant later, later suffocated. They're not to be messed with. If any animal were silly enough to actually attack a honey badger, it would get a nasty surprise. If they're grabbed, say, by 
a leopard, the badger can actually rotate within its skin. So it could actually turn around and actually bite back. They're amazing little creatures. But there is a sweeter side to the honey badger. As their name suggests, they love honey and will raid beehives to get it. So, in an attempt to stay in their good books, Ben is giving them a treat. I'll hang it off a stick over the edge, just so I don't have to put my hands in there. Morning, kids. As you can see, they absolutely love honey. I do like looking after honey badgers, because they have character, you know. They're fearless. They're more than happy to take you on if they need to. And they do have sweet characters, you know. But they will come up to the side and lick honey off a stick. On the other hand, you know, you chuck a bit of meat in there, they, they just rip it to shreds. They're just lovely characters, you know, with an element of ferociousness. <laughs> if we had to go to war, I'd love a honey badger on my side. <laughs> name suggests, these Javan langurs come from the island of Java in Indonesia. Like humans, Javans can have different coloured hair. They are all born orange, but some go black at six months old. Their funky hair makes them one of the world's coolest looking monkeys. Javan langurs are critically endangered, with only 2,000 left in the wild. So breeding is vital for the survival of the species. The park's breeding record is unrivaled. They have celebrated 150 births in just 20 years. And today, more than 20% of Europe's captive population live at the park. But it's not all good news. Following his grilling about the capuchin monkeys, Simon has noticed one of the male langurs has what appears to be a nasty injury. We noticed that um, Rye, the Javan langur male, is not using his hand very well. Um, his right hand seems quite swollen, and he's obviously in a little bit of pain because he's... Um seeing it all the time and trying to touch it. He hasn't really been gripping any food. So we're going to get the vet to come along, have a look at him and decide what to do. Vet Jane Hopper has come to investigate. Hello, Simon. Hello. What's what have we got this morning? Well, the problem we've got today, Jane, is um, I think that um, Rye, the yes. black male in here, he's actually had a bite wound to his hand and it seems to have swollen up quite badly. So I okay. just want you to have a good look at it. And when did you first notice that? Well, I noticed it first this morning. He wouldn't okay. take his cheese off me and you could see that he obviously <laughs> wasn't using his hand okay. um, at all or even gripping with the fingers, so it okay. looks quite bad. And it's likely one of the others has bitten him? Yeah, I think it is, yeah. OK, well, have a look. Rye is already in his bedroom, but he must be injected with anaesthetic for Jane to look at him. Simon and Haley hastily prepare a box known as the crush, which they will use to catch Rye. It may look nasty, but this is the quickest and least stressful way to give him the drugs. Putting any animal under anaesthetic is a massive risk, but if he is not treated, the wound will get infected and could kill him. Rye is secured, so Jane quickly injects him. It's very important that Rye can now calmly fall asleep. Obviously, you know, for them to be put in a little cage and then given the injection is quite stressful, but really the amount of pain he's in with the hand, you know, is quite bad. So I think to be stressed for a couple of minutes and then actually get the hand sorted out so we know it's not going to track up the arm or anything like that. Caring for rare animals like Rye is what Simon's job is all about. Well, we're always worried about their welfare. We don't want any animals to suffer in any way, shape or form. So, you know, we want to see to all their wounds and any other treatments that need to be done as quickly and swiftly as possible. These are quite a rare animal. They come from Java, which is being deforested at an alarming rate. We've been incredibly successful with Java langurs over the years. You don't want to lose the monkey in any way, so you have to be aware of all these little wounds that come about. Rye is now safely asleep, so Jane can begin her examination. Jane has to be as quick as possible. The longer he is under anaesthetic, the less chance he has of waking up. Ooh, look, at that. look away now if you're eating. Oh, that's very nasty. As you can see there. You can see there, that's obviously a bite wound. The damage to his hand is far worse than expected. It's incredibly lucky that Simon spotted it. I thought it was just going to be a punch wound through the hand that had possibly sort of concepted, but obviously he's been badly bitten there. And it's really good Simon noticed it and we knocked him out today. This could become incredibly infected. 
And you can see the wound is very, very deep and quite close to his bones, and his whole hand could, you know, become really very swollen, very infected, um, and that could be really nasty for him. Um, it was probably a hierarchy challenge, you know, he was obviously in the wrong place at the wrong time. One of the other males wanted to be higher than him. It just happens, unfortunately, especially when it is all males. Because um, it's a bite from another monkey, if we stitch it up, it will turn into a really big abscess. So the best thing at this stage is just to clean it completely out, give him some strong antibiotics, and be amazed at how quickly it's just completely better. All right, so I'm just going to give him an antibiotic injection. The wound has been cleaned. Jane takes this opportunity to weigh him and check that everything else is OK. He is given a revival drug and left alone to wake up in peace. The next step now is we just want to leave him in peace and quiet, really, so we'll need to leave the shed and then we'll just um, let him come round on his own, really. That went incredibly well for us. We saw his wound, how bad it was. It was incredibly important the vet saw that and got a close look at it. Um, we've given him his injections. We weighed him, so we've got some more information on him, which is always handy. And um, he's sort of coming round already at the moment, so it's great. And there's always a worry about this kind of bite because it can get into the bone or track up the arm. So that's why Simon is very good, and he always calls us at the first sign of a bite or an injury, and you can clean it out, give them some antibiotics and prevent anything else happening. We want to get him reintroduced as soon as possible. And then over the next couple of days, or really for the next five days while he's having his antibiotics, we'll be checking him daily. The most important thing now is that Rye is able to rest so the drugs can totally wear off. But he's not out of the woods yet. The longer he is separated from the group, the less likely it is that they'll accept him. And if the group turned on him, he could sustain even more serious injuries. These are worrying times for the keepers and we'll be back later on to see how it goes. Earlier on today, we came up to see the Barbary Lions, and I attempted to make a plaster of Paris paw prints. Ooh, that's a tongue twister. How's it going, Adrian? Well, I think it's ready, so if you want to Is reveal it, your masterpiece. Hard. OK, fingers crossed. Uh, Here it comes. I'm nervous. Oh, hey! Look at that! That's brilliant. That's a great That's a one, one, isn't it? Isn't that fantastic? And this is Jabir's paw, isn't it, Adrian? He's, That's right. Is he fully grown yet? No, he's, um, he's only three, and males probably keep on growing for another year up until they're four years old. So if you come back next year, I would expect it to be maybe quarter as big again. Oh, yeah, really? I'd love to do that. It's certainly a lot bigger than your pet cat at home, <laughs> for sure. Are you pleased with that, then? That'd be That's a good one. Good. Yeah, so it's going to be great for the education department. That's going to work really well for them. Brilliant. Thanks a lot. No, thank you very much. That was lovely. And we've still got loads of animal action and fascinating facts still to come on today's programme. I'm about to meet a teeny tiny chameleon who has very googly eyes. We meet a cat that loves swimming and squirty cream. And Alex finds out why elephants were nearly wiped off the planet. If you're afraid of snakes, look away now. If you're worried about being stung by an emperor scorpion, you better get behind the sofa. And if the thought of beetles who survive by eating poo makes your stomach turn, then you'd better not come here, because this is where the park keeps all their creepy crawlies. Matt's feeling brave, so he's gone up there today. I've come over to the Discovery Zone because Susie the Chameleon here, who's with Keeper Rich Barnes, is shedding her skin. Rich, is that what these sort of white bits are here? Yep, it's just the last few flakes of it coming off. She shed most of it. As you can see, the rest of the body's kind of clear. And, um, yep, she just shed the last few big patches over her face and stuff. All right, and how often will chameleons shed their skin? Uh, about every 12 weeks or so. Um, it, it varies a little bit because um, they, they grow at sort of fluctuating oh. growth rates. Um, sometimes they'll shed quite quickly, um, and sometimes it'll take longer. They won't eat as much, so they won't grow as fast. She's got amazing, vivid colours underneath. Do you think they're more vivid because she's just shed? Um, well, no, she's just changing sort of constantly because um, they get a little bit stressed or they're a little bit anxious or they want to just kind of blend in or whatever. Um, she's, she's kind of flash colouring don't really think they're totally conscious of it because of how fast it happens. Right. So maybe they, they get in a mood, but their body does it without them kind of really knowing about it. Yes. 
You've got a few chameleons here. Have they ever bred? Uh, well, interestingly enough, we've got some, some youngsters which have hatched out only this week. Oh, can um, we see them? Yeah, we can see them. I'll just put her back in. Wonderful. And we'll go over. Come on, then. Brilliant the way she holds on, isn't she? Yeah. Are they in this tank? Yeah. Oh, yeah, they're the They're absolutely tiny, Rich. They don't stay with their, with their mum, then? Uh, no, um, most reptiles, bar just a couple, um, will lay eggs and then they're pretty much independent from the off. Yeah, so the moment they're hatched, it, you know, they had to completely fend yeah. for themselves? Yeah, I mean, these little guys already, they've got the ability to um, change colour, use their tongue to catch food, um, not fully sussed out how to use their tails yet, but um, they'll get it soon enough. Look at that. Oh, what a beautiful little thing. Perfect miniature, and as you can see, all the eyes already moving independently. So cute. And how long is it taking to get to this size? Do you oh, think? they're born at this size. Oh, they yeah, yeah. This one's uh, just a couple of days old. Um, they've all been born within sort of five or six days of each other. Um, there's still plenty hatching out at the moment. There's one probably due to come up this afternoon, and um, the rest are kind of be shortly to follow. Gorgeous little things. And then we've got another batch as well, which should hatch out in maybe two months' time. What a success. And so the mother lays eggs, does she? Yep, and um, both of the females, although they're quite young, had um, around 35 eggs each in each clutch. Is that a usual? Uh, it's about average. Um, I thought because they were younger, there'd be less, but um, it seems to have been about the same. Yes. And um, the eggs aren't small, I mean, you know, to fit that in when it's fully grown, they're yeah. about so big. Yeah. And so one of those small females to have, yeah. yeah. Rich, they've already got these amazingly active eyes and spinning around in different directions. Is that unique to the species? Well, yeah, only chameleons have the ability to do this. And the main reason for doing it is um, once they've sort of clocked on the, the prey item that they want to take, they'll, um, they'll keep one eye fixed on it so they know where it's moving and all that sort of stuff, and then they'll keep one eye looking around just to be aware of what's going on around them for predators or whatever. So, so they're completely independent? Yeah. And what, so one could look back and one could look forward? Exactly, yeah. Um, I don't quite know how that works. I mean, it must send two different signals to the brain, but it must just, you know, know how to program it and very, work very it. Very, clever, yeah. isn't it? They're absolutely fantastic. I'm thrilled to see them. It is genuinely the tiniest lizard I think I've ever seen. Yeah, they're pretty small. Earlier on, Alex had a play with Melindy the serval, who the keepers can get really close to because she was hand-raised. Well, now it's time to meet another hand-raised cat. This is Louis, and he is a fishing cat. Everyone thinks that cats don't like water, but Louis loves it. Fishing cats are found in Southeast Asia, where they live near rivers or marshlands. They are one of the best swimmers in the cat world and will dive right under the water to catch their favourite meal, fish. Keeper Neville Buck counts this little fisherman as one of his best friends. He's coming up for 10 years old now. They're not all normally as friendly as uh, Louis. He's just as exceptionally friendly because... Uh... Hang on, son, hang on, wait a minute. Because he was hand raised um, from about three, we three weeks old, there was him and uh, his sibling um, getting on fine, being raised by mum. And from the age of three weeks, his sibling was um, she's actually killed by the mum. So just as a precaution, we took Louis out and uh, hand raised him at home. He was brought up with well, at the time there was. Uh, we had three domestic cats, um, learned him a little bit of cat etiquette and uh, he, he actually grew up knowing he was a cat and not a person. Neville had to teach Louis how to be a fishing cat and that meant teaching him to like water. But with no river at home, he had to do a little bit of improvising. Obviously being a fishing cat, uh, a lot of his behaviour revolves around water. And I mean, to begin with, he, he would go on plodge and play about in the, the cat's water bowls, then progress to a foot spa, washing up bowl while you're washing the dishes there, kind of sorting bubbles in the water bowl, and he's got his feet in there, fishing around in amongst it all, but also um, in the bath. Splish, splash, I was taking a bath. 
song about a Saturday night. Yeah. Rubbed up, just relaxing in the tub, thinking everything was all right. Well, I stepped out the tub, and put my feet on the floor. I wrapped the towel around me and I opened the door. And in a splish splash, I jumped back in the bath. Well, how was I to know there was a party going on? There was a splishing and a splash. To be honest, it's a total fallacy that cats don't like water. I mean, obviously some cats don't. Um, fishing cats and, and certainly ocelots that we've got here, um, they'll quite happily go into the water, especially on a hot day. They've been known just to sit in the middle of the pond, just just um, kind of chilling out and and just, well, generally cooling down, really. In the wild, Louis would not only eat fish, but would also hunt rodents, frogs and even snakes. Today, however, Neville has brought something Louis would never get in the wild. We've got a bit of a treat we give him every now and again, a bit of squirty cream, which um, it's something he, he found he liked when uh, my daughter at the time, she used to put it on her, on her cornflakes. And he jumped on the table one day and thought, hey, this is not bad. It's not something he gets very often, because obviously too much wouldn't be good for him, but uh, a little treat once in, once in a while is not too bad. Fishing cats are perfectly built for swimming. They have sleek, long bodies and a special coat to help them keep dry. The rain tends not really bother them too much. Um, their, their coats are, are fairly waterproof anyway. I mean, you can see it's raining at the moment, but, I mean, it's pretty dry, really. Um, they've got a quite dense undercoat. And, uh, I mean, even if he goes into the water and comes out, he's a bit like a dog, he can give a shake and uh, there's, there's not really any, any wet on him. Louis has already been mixed with a girl cat and they got on so well that Neville the Keeper became a proud granddad. It is his uh, second uh, litter he's sired. It's obviously great that he's, um, he's produced and uh, got on well with a female and obviously this is now his second litter, so... It's, it's just great that he's, he's behaving normally and, and naturally. We will be keeping a close eye on the progress of both Louis and his kittens over the rest of the series. <laughs> what do rabbits do when they get married? Live happily ever after? <laughs> what animals do you have to be careful of when you take an exam? Cheetahs. <laughs> How do snails get their shells so shiny? They use snail varnish. <laughs> this beautiful animal is a Canadian timber wolf. I'm on my way to meet Ben, the keeper, because he knows loads about them, and I have a stack of questions to put to him. Let's see how he gets on. Hi, Ben. Hi. Well, we've got lots of great questions for you about the timber wolves, and the first one is from Thomas Solomon, who's aged 11. Do they howl at a full moon? Do they howl when there's a full moon? Uh, it's a little bit of a myth. Uh howling through full moons and stuff. Uh, obviously, you would probably catch a wolf every now and then howling during a full moon when one's available, uh, but generally, they'll howl whenever they feel like it. Generally, a bit of a myth. OK, yeah. thank you for that, Ben. Next up, we've got a question from Anwar Anifawashi, who's 10. Do they have sharp teeth? Yeah, they have very sharp teeth. Basically, you know, they have bones in their food and they have to crunch them up and they'll rip the meat off the bone as well, so, yeah, very sharp, very powerful jaws as well. Now, we've got a question here from Joshua Turner, who is 11. In the wild, do they always hunt in packs? Do they always hunt in packs? Always. Uh, it's the way they do it. It's a very strong structure in a pack. Uh, a couple will try and head off the animal. And, you know, there'll be several in a, in a hunt. Uh, and so there, would there be a dominant male within a pack? Uh, yes, uh, and he would be the one giving the orders, uh, and he would probably more than likely be the one that takes it down, be the first in there, uh, and the rest will help out along the way. Excellent question, very interesting. Thanks for that, Joshua. Now, next question is... Can they see in the dark? They can. Uh, they don't s see like humans do. Dogs see in black and white, so they're very efficient in the dark, and mm. most of the time they will be hunting, doing their thing in the dark. 
because I guess they can creep up on their prey much yeah, more easily in the dark. Under the cover of darkness, yeah. Fascinating Better stuff. Way. We've time for just one more question, and that's from Hannah Spicely, who's nine. Would they ever attack humans? If you're in the wrong spot at the wrong time, probably yes, in the wild. If they're hungry, they'll, yeah, they'll take you down. You wouldn't have, have a chance. You wouldn't have a hope. Well, no. Ben, thank you so much for such brilliant answers. It's been fascinating to learn lots about the timber wolf. But that's all we've got time for. But join us next time for more questions on Ask the Keeper. Earlier in the show, Simon discovered that one of his male Javan langers, Rai, had injured his hand in a fight with one of the other boys in his group. Simon called in Jane the vet, who had to put Rai under anaesthetic. He had been badly bitten, so Jane cleaned the wound and gave him some antibiotics. If Simon hadn't noticed the injury, poor Rai may have become very ill. It has been a few hours since Rai woke up and he's doing really well. Simon has popped back for a checkup, armed with some treats. Well, we managed to put him back into the group without any problems. Once he'd woken up from the anaesthetic, uh, we gave him another couple of hours to make sure he was fully compus mentis. And then he um, went straight back in and actually all went up to him and hugged him, which was really nice to see. And um, he's getting on very well. He's starting to use his hands. You can see he's actually gripping a peanut there at the moment. So he's actually starting to grip with it and such like. Uh, the other members of the group have been acting normally towards him. They've been as if there's nothing happened, obviously, at all. So, I mean, that's exactly what you want, really. He's a little bit slower at the moment, but not a lot, even with, like, one hand down. He's very careful. He does hold it up, and he'll run around pretty much the same as the other. But um, he'll obviously be a bit quieter at the moment because of this wound. Um, and he obviously doesn't want to get hurt anymore. So if there's any trouble in the group, then he will stay away more at the moment. But, I mean, he should get it back quite quickly, really. Now that he is happily back with the group and the antibiotics are doing their job, Rai should be swinging through his enclosure with the rest of the langers in no time. The African elephants are by far the biggest animals at the park, but their incredible size hasn't prevented them from being savagely hunted in the wild. Alex has gone to meet elephant keeper Dave Magna to find out why. I'm holding an elephant's tusk. It's made of ivory and is extremely valuable. But sadly, for that reason, many elephants in the wild continue to be hunted for their tusks. Dave, this, I mean, why is this so valuable? It's very valuable to the trinket makers in places like China. They make things like this, very ornamental uh, mm. jewelry. Um, and sadly, you know, the elephants have to lose their lives for the sake of people's obsession with, you know, with, with ivory. You know. Killing elephants for their ivory is big business and has had a terrible impact on the species. 30 years ago, there were approximately one and a half million elephants in the wild, but since then, a million have been killed by man. Despite the ivory trade being illegal today, the killing does continue. And, I mean, these tusks are absolutely incredible. They're, they're really heavy, actually, and they seem to have, like, an opening there, and then it feels like that's quite solid from there. Is that right? Well, this, the actual opening there is actually where that would join the, the, the top of the head. That, that, that would be where the nerve endings are, and as, as the tusk gets narrower, it gets more solid. Then the next question, of course, is how big do these tusks go and is it, does it tell you how old an elephant is? Well, looking at that, I would say she was probably round about 14, maybe, maybe a bit older. But, I mean, that tusk could grow a lot, lot, more, lot much bigger. So as the elephant gets older, it gets longer and longer? It'll get longer in it and also it'll get fatter. And Dave, we've got one of the baby elephants here. When is Jara going to develop tusks? Well, she'll have, like, little pegs at the moment, so... Maybe in another year, they'll just start protruding. And, uh... So although we can't see them, they are in there oh, somewhere? Oh, yeah, they're there. Yeah, but... How old is Shara? She's a year old now. So another year, she'll start to develop tusks? Yeah, she'll have like, little pegs. Dave, there's an elephant here with two quite, quite sizeable tusks. Uh, how old is she? T this is Tammy. She's uh, 18 now. 
Yeah, her tusks can grow quite a lot more yet. You know, as she gets older, they'll get longer and longer. There's no doubt about it. This might be beautiful, but it looks an awful lot better on an elephant. I'm with primate keeper Lucy Burkett, and she's brought me to see a very special monkey. She's the oldest Saki monkey in the whole of the world that's in captivity. She does look quite sort of um, ragged around the edges. How old is she? Uh, she's 32. All right. In human years, that doesn't seem too old. Um, but um, how would it compare? Um, definitely in her 90s, like possibly even in her 100s. Really? She's oh, old. she's a properly, properly old lady then. Yeah. What's her name? Barima. Hey, Barima, are you going to come and say hello? Not right now. <laughs> I think it's a very slow pace anyway. <laughs> yes, yep. It <laughs> takes her time. She does look a bit, you know, her, her fur looks a little thin and. Uh, She's moving very slowly. Are those all signs of old age? Yes, yeah, normally she'd have a much thicker tail than that, and, um, but uh, it's starting to come out a bit now. In the wild, Lucy, how old would these psyche monkeys live to? Uh, they lived about 14 years, so not nearly as long as she's lived That's to. That's amazing. Yeah. What part of the world are they from? South America. All right. And she's in there with um, someone else. Who's that? Yep, she's in with her son, Bagel. Oh, that's her son. They look yeah. very different. Yeah, completely different. They have completely different coats. So, And the, the males start brown. They start the same colour as the female. And about two months, they start going black and their white face starts coming up. Mm -hmm. so. And she's right up in the top of the enclosure at the moment. Um, would they live up in the canopy of the trees in the wild? Yes, yeah, they're not, they don't live right at the top. They're kind of mid-ranging and they will come down to the bottom to pick up bits of fruit or, you know, drop seeds or whatever. They've got um, specially um, designed teeth and fingers, which means they um, can, you know, get hold of the so really solid fruits and crack them open with their teeth and then pull them apart with their fingers like this mm -hmm. and uh, get to the seeds inside. So. Yeah, so you can see her long fingers there. They look very dexterous. She's holding yeah. them tight. There's just a pair here, but yeah. uh, do they live in bigger groups? They live or in family not? groups, so they have a pair and their offspring, and then sometimes if there's lots of food around, then the groups will all congregate together, and sometimes you might get as many as 50. Really? But, but generally, they're in their smaller groups. And in her 30-odd years, has she had a family? <laughs> yeah, she's had loads of babies. She's had 14. 14? So, yep, she's Good quite girl. a mum. That's a big family. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she, must be a, she must be a grandmother, maybe even a great-grandmother yeah, by now, then. I would have thought so. Oh, well, uh, I hope I look as um, happy as she does at that age. It's <laughs> lovely to see her. Thank you very much, Lucy. almost it for today, but before we go, we've just come down to meet Keeper Rich Barnes, who's here with three of his smallest charges. Uh, and we're not talking about this huge fella. We're talking about oh, the three cubs over here. There are two males and a female. They're almost a year old now, and you can just start to tell the difference between them because the male's mane is coming through. Oh, Hi, Rich. Hi. Well, you could certainly see his mane, Rich, and as I was just saying, it's coming through on the new ones. Why do the um, males have this mane? OK, well, yeah, like you say, it's just started to come through. Usually uh, about sort of two, um, two years old, you can see the proper kind of starts of the mane. Already they've got kind of the rough round here on the chest and a kind of line that just goes down. as like a Mohican down the neck. Um, but, yeah, the reason they've got this, a uh, couple of reasons. Firstly, um, they want to impress the ladies. The bigger your mane, the more impressive you look. Um, and as well, when they're fighting with other males, it uh, gives them a little bit of added protection. Um, yes. Obviously, before in intimidating the, the other male with kind of the size of your mane, yes. and if he does get hold of you, it's very, very thick. Um, the older they get, the thicker it gets and kind of matted and stuff, and so it acts as an extra layer of protection. Oh, very clever. And in the wild, how long would the cubs stay with the family? Um, usually uh, up until about two, maybe just after two years old. So most prides that you'd find in the wild would have one big male and then a group of females and their young? Uh, usually, yeah. 
Well, it's awesome to see them, and I'm sure we'll be back again and again to see these lovely cubs grow up. Unfortunately, we're completely out of time, so thanks very much, okay. Rich. Thanks, but don't Rich. worry, because we've got many more animals coming up in the next show. It's just a little tease of what's in store. This family cat becomes a friend for life. A greedy guts gorilla wants to know what's for lunch. And what's the point of a rhino's horn?